Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's great to welcome you here, Uh, those who are joining us online as well. Uh, I'm going to begin our service this morning by reading some words from Psalm 47. And the psalmist uh, doesn't hold back in his encouragement to the people of God to praise God. And we have opportunity to do that this morning. Maybe you've been coming to church for many years. And this can seem like, you know, when we do things regularly, it gets a bit kind of ordinary, doesn't it? We get used to it, how it works, and uh, we kind of know what to expect or what not to expect. This morning is a new opportunity for us to gather as God's people in his presence, for him to meet with us as we make us ourselves aware of his presence. And we have opportunity to praise God, who is worthy of our praise. So the psalmist declares, clap your hands, all you nations. It's okay to clap your hands if you feel the desire at any points, especially after the sermon. No, <laughs> no, don't do that. As worship of God. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Let's pray together. Father God, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for this opportunity that we have this morning to gather as your people, to worship you, to give you our praise, to open your word, to receive from you, to spend time together in fellowship as your people. Lord, help us to make the most of this opportunity. Make us aware of your presence, God. Have your way with this time now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we begin in sung worship.
Father God, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you that you have given us yourself in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've made us holy through his death and resurrection. Thank you that we can live in relationship with you, worship and serve you every day through faith in him. Amen.
Please do have a seat. We have a faithful God who has rescued us and called us his children, adopted us into his family. Isn't that amazing? What a great and wonderful God we have. What an incredible saviour. A few things to let you know about uh, by way of notices in the life of our church. Uh, so this coming Wednesday is stay and play for uh, children, uh, primary school age or so, uh, starting at 10 a.m., including a ball pool and soft play, uh, which sounds like good fun, doesn't it? So if you know any children, uh, they're very welcome to come along. If you want to know more about that, speak to Emma or Janet. They'll tell you all about it. Another reminder for you uh, about the Forge men's event, which is happening uh, from 1 p.m. on Saturday the 10th of September to 1 p.m. on Saturday the 11th of September. It's a 24-hour men's event aimed particularly at those who aren't used to going to church, who perhaps don't yet have faith in Jesus as Saviour. So if you've got a friend, a neighbour, a family member, anyone you could invite along, please do so. You can book now via the website, theforge.zone. Uh, the Yes, the forge.zone is the, the title of the website. If you Google the forge.zone, you'll find it. Uh, 20 pounds. At the end of this month, they will go up to 25 pounds. That will be the price that you'll have to pay on the gate. So get your tickets now because it helps those who are planning to know how many burgers to buy for the barbecue and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I encourage you to think about that, come along, pray about who you can invite. And then uh, some news which I think is good news is that I will be away on annual leave. Uh, for the rest of this month from Tuesday of this week. So just uh, to letting you know about that, uh, going away with the family for a bit of a break. Um, if you need to contact uh, the church in case of emergency or anything like that, the first point of call would be the church office, uh, Monday to Friday during the mornings, the pastoral care team or one of the deacons in my absence. If there are emergencies, I can be contacted, um, but I'm going to try and ignore the emails and things like that to have a bit of a break, if that's all right with you. Most of, as enough of you nodded that I'm going to take my holiday and ignore the emails. It's great. We're going to spend some time now in prayer. And uh, there's much going on in our world which uh, we want to bring before God, isn't there? There's much that we know is not the way that God would want things to be. So let's come before our loving God now in prayer. Father, we've been singing about your faithfulness. It's singing that you have rescued us. It's singing that you adopt us into your family. We are your children. It's singing that there's now no need for us to fear. Because you're with us. Lord, we look around the world and we see so many things which make us worry. Which give us cause for concern. Which can tempt us to be afraid. We come to you now knowing that you are a God who is faithful. A God who does rescue. God who protects us as your loved children. Lord, we cry out to you again for the nation of Ukraine. We continue to pray, God, that you would bring peace. Lord, we continue to hear uh, concerning things on, our, uh, on the news and we read about them and things, uh, and Lord, it, it concerns us, it worries us, and we recognize that this war in Ukraine is having far-reaching implications across your world. We recognize that there are those who've lost loved ones, those who are suffering and are injured, those who have been displaced from their homes. We recognize that there are those who are finding it difficult to find the basic necessities of life, food and clothing and water and, and shelter, sanitation. But we pray that you provide for the needs of those who are vulnerable. We pray that you would speed the work of the agencies who are working to bring relief. That we pray for the mediators and negotiators who are trying to uh, find a way to bring about peace. Lord, give them wisdom, God. And that we pray for the nation of Russia as well. Many in Russia are against the war. Many uh, perhaps don't know all of the truth. Many who would want to lobby and uh, campaign against their government and its actions at this time. Lord, we pray that you would give uh, volume to their voices. 
And we pray for Vladimir Putin and the, uh, the regime in Russia. We pray for the government and the leaders, the decision makers. Lord, would you soften their hearts? Would you cause them to make decisions which lead to peace rather than further conflict? And we pray, Lord, for the, uh, the implications for the wider world. Food and grain shortages and uh, energy crises and all kinds of things driving costs of living up. Perhaps for us, some of us are, are finding it tricky with the in increased costs of living. And the war in Ukraine is part of that. Lord, we pray for those who uh, are in desperate need of food, of grain, of help in various ways. God, would you provide for their needs? Father, we thank you for this wonderful creation that you've given to us and entrusted to us as stewards. But we confess to you that we are not being good stewards in many ways. We ask that you would help us to know the changes that we can make which will have a positive impact on your creation. But we recognize that the climate is changing. And we pray for those uh, little decisions that we can make, the little changes that we can make in our lives which can uh, positively affect climate rather than negatively. Help us to uh, be wise about these things, God, and to make those decisions. And we pray, Lord, for uh, those who make decisions on a wider scale, impacting uh, more people and more areas. Decisions which uh, can sometimes lead to... Uh, things happening in your creation, extreme weather events and floods and droughts and the like. But we pray uh, that those decision makers would be uh, just convicted by your spirit somehow to change policies, uh, to implement laws and regulations which prevent the things which are harming your creation. And again, Lord, we pray for those who are most vulnerable, those who, again, because of climate crisis have been displaced from their homes, those who are struggling to farm the land as they once did, those who are waiting for the rain even more than we are at the moment for survival. But we pray for these folk and we pray for the organisations that are seeking to help them, educate and equip them so they can provide the necessities for life which we often take for granted. And Father, we pray for those uh, who we know who particularly need your help at this time. Lord, we lift uh, Shirley Summers to you and her family uh, following news of uh, some cancer treatment that she's requiring surgery for. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would give great skill and wisdom to the medical professionals caring for her. We pray for Shirley and for Lindsay, uh, for Ruth and Beth, that you would give them uh, your peace and uh, help in all the ways that they need. Pray that they would enjoy a summer break, and uh, Lord, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. Continue to pray for Keith Usher, Lord, as uh, he continues to recuperate in Lodor Care Home, just locally now. Pray for Keith and for Anne, that they would know your presence and your blessing in the ways that they need. Pray for, pray for the whole family as well. And Lord, we pray for those who... Uh, our missing loved ones who are no longer with us. Those who know the pain of loss and grief. Would you show us, Lord, uh, how we can stand with them as brothers and sisters. We pray for them now that they would know your love, your presence and your peace in the ways that they need. And Father, now as we turn to your word, we thank you and that your word is alive and speaks to us of who you are. So speak to us now, Lord. Your servants are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our series on creation care. And uh, the series is looking through uh, the creation account in Genesis 1, taking each of the days of creation and using that as a springboard to help us to think about this wonderful creation that God's given us and how we can care for it. And so we reach today Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. The words will be up on the screen for you, and I will read Genesis 1, 9 to 13. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. 
and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruits with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. We're thinking about uh, those verses and creation a little bit more. In a few moments we continue in sung worship now. I invite you to stand as we sing again.
Amen. Please do have a seat. His goodness will lead us home. But at this time, we're still here. So what about here and now? What about the world as it is now and this creation? We're continuing this creation care series. And this week we're looking at Let the Land Produce Vegetation. As we continue through this uh, Genesis account of creation, we see a beautiful movement taking place. We started with the emptiness and the formlessness of watery chaos. And as the Spirit of God hovered or moved over it, so God spoke and light was created, preparing the conditions for his creation, for life, and for it to be seen. And then order was brought to the waters as they were separated into the water in the atmosphere above and the water on the earth below. And now we see the waters on earth being gathered together and drawn back like a curtain so that dry drown might appear. And as that happens, so the land and the seas are brought into being. I wonder if you can imagine this happening in your mind's eye. The chaos of the waters, light, waters separating above and below, and then the waters below being drawn back, dry land appearing. We'll consider the seas in a few uh, weeks' time, but this week we're going to focus on land and vegetation. And we live in such a beautiful world, don't we? I wonder if you've ever been amazed by the beauty of a particularly stunning tree. Pete Gregg, Pete Greg, the founder of uh, 24-7 Prayer, tells a story of a time when he was out for a walk and he felt like God was telling him um, to look at a particular tree. And he explains he doesn't often hear God or sense God in that really clear way. Um, I think that gives us some encouragement, probably. Um, but he, on this occasion, he was sure it was God and God was telling him to look at this tree. So he began to look at the tree and he said, I wonder what God is trying to speak to me, what he's trying to tell me through this tree. And he got all holy, so I think, oh, maybe it's to do with being reminded about the roots going down. I need to have my roots in God and be firmly uh, established in him, relationship with him, and Bible and prayer and quiet time. Maybe it's that. And he kind of thought, no, it doesn't feel about right, although it is a good thing. And he said, well, maybe, it's, uh, maybe he wants me to branch out into something new. Uh, maybe he's telling me there's some new opportunity that I need to uh, chase after. And that didn't feel quite right anyway. And then he went, oh, maybe someone's going to come along and it's someone that God wants me to notice by this tree and I need to speak to them or pray for them or something. And so he was looking around for people, but there was no one there. And he, in the end, he kind of, after going all through this sort of stuff, he said to God, why do you want me to look at this tree? And he felt God say to him, I just thought it was a pretty cool tree. <laughs> God looks at his creation and sees it is good. And uh, we see in our passage today, the second and the third occurrences of that statement, God saw that it was good. This phrase is used seven times in Genesis 1, including verse 31, where God declares that all he has made is very good, which reflects the understanding of completeness within Israelite thinking. God saw that it was good. And this is really important. It shouldn't be uh, under, underestimated, the importance of God looking at his creation and seeing that it is good, very good. I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of kind of separating out the physical from the spiritual. We have this kind of sacred-secular divide it's been uh, um, described as by some people, where we think that the spiritual stuff is more important than the physical that we see around us. But well, that's not what the Bible teaches, and then that's not God's view. God wants us to hold these things together. We're complete people, physical and spiritual, and God's creation is a very important part of our lives and our faith. Sometimes we can think that being a Christian is about uh, kind of going out in our lifeboats as Christians, rescuing people, getting them in the lifeboat, and then whisking them off somewhere so that they can be saved somewhere else in heaven. But the message of the Bible is that Jesus came to earth, to this earth, to save this earth and this creation, to renew it. And when he comes again, this is where we will be. And God, heaven will come crashing into earth, is one way of describing it. 
not whisking us off somewhere different. So these, God saw that it was good statements, reveal that each part of God's creation is, is good. It has its own value. Professor David Wilkinson says, matter matters to God, which is quite a clever way of expressing it, isn't it? A wonderful phrase that speaks of the value and the goodness of each part of God's creation. The Western world has tended to devalue creation, too often to see it as a commodity to be consumed. And the Christian church has often joined in too. But God declares that the seas and the lands, the plants and the trees are good. He looks upon what he's made. And his perception is that it's good. To know that God sees what he's made gives it value. And, thinks that, and that he thinks that it's good gives it value. And it's a deep call for us to reflect on how we view the world around us. If we're really honest with ourselves, do we perceive the wider world primarily as a resource for us to use or do we regard it primarily as something God loves and that is precious to him this weekend I had a chance to visit my parents briefly and uh, in my parents house there hangs a tapestry on the wall that my mum uh, made tapestried, what's the word you use created, whatever it is, you know I don't, um, I've never done a tapestry But this beautiful tapestry hangs in my parents' house. And mum took quite a lot of effort to make it. She loves it, and it hangs on the wall. Now imagine if she were to come home one day and find me using her tapestry, I've taken it out of the frame, to clean my muddy boots. She would not be too impressed, I would tell you. In fact, I can tell you with all confidence that that would never happen. Not just because I'm still afraid of my mother, but because... (laughs) No, rather, because I love my mum. And so I love the tapestry because she loves it. I saw when I was younger the effort and the time that it took for her to create it. So I'd never wipe my muddy boots on it. God's affirmation of goodness and value of this world spurs us on to take care that we do not wipe our ecological footprints all over it, leaving it damaged and wrecked. Let's consider the importance of land through the Bible for a few moments. We don't have a disembodied faith, but one that is rooted, rooted in place and land and in the whole world that God has created. The wider creation is not simply the background, it is the context within which we live our faith. And it's an integral part of how we work out our salvation. So this passage in uh, Genesis 1, 9 to 13 particularly, And its emphasis on seed-bearing plants and trees reminds us that the people in the scriptures live their lives deeply dependent on agriculture. And it is a reminder too that however urban we may have become, we all depend on agriculture for our existence. Even if that connection may feel distant for some of us and is easily forgotten. The land plays a crucial role, doesn't it, in the story of the people of God in the Old Testament, how they live uh, on it is key, a key part of how they walk with God and follow his ways. Psalm 24.1, they're always to remember that the, Lord, the land belongs ultimately to God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, declares the psalmist. The land that they've been given, uh, the promised land, they were given as a gift, weren't they? We can uh, read about the story throughout the Old Testament. They had to see, see themselves as tenants of the land, Leviticus reminds them. And Moses tells them in Deuteronomy 8, 17 to 18, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. I think sometimes we can read the Old Testament and we think it's the story of God working with his people. It's the story of God restoring Uh, his people's relationship with him through the laws that he gives and the establishment of the priesthood and the sacrificial system. And of course, all of that is right, but it cannot ever be divorced from how the people relate to God's creation, both human and wider. The Old Testament is the story of a promised people in a promised land. 
the quality of the people's relationship with God, their righteousness is seen precisely in how they treat one another and how they treat the land. And the land itself doesn't stay uh, inert and silent in the Bible, does it? Uh, the scriptures uh, portray it as uh, having kind of a, uh, a personality, an agency of its own. Psalm 148 shows all manner of uh, God's creation exuberantly praising God. The mountains and the hills, the fruit trees and cedars. And Isaiah describes the mountains and the hills as bursting forth into song before their God on account of the people returning to him. And the trees of the fields clapping their hands. What a great image that is, isn't it? It's in the Bible. The trees of the fields clap their hands. And in looking at the New uh, Testament, we see Paul describing the whole of creation as groaning in pain, as if in labour, eagerly awaiting for the children of God to be revealed. Again, a really powerful image. I've had the privilege of being present at three births, and there is lots of groaning in pain. Paul says, all of creation is groaning in pain, waiting. So the land in all its dusty, soily, muddy, earthy physicality is an indispensable part of the story of salvation. And it's no surprise, therefore, that the future, which we'll explore a bit more in future weeks, retains that dimension. The Old Testament envisages a time when the people would live in their own houses and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. And that happened. And then the New Testament looks even further into the future, doesn't it? To the picture of a garden city with a river and trees. And that concept of the garden city may give hope to those of us who are urbanites, city folk, who are wondering how we got into this place of talking about soil and land when our experience is primarily concrete and glass. The Bible reflects the diverse context of the people of God. Particularly in the New Testament, they are gathered together into cities and there's nothing wrong with cities in and of themselves. We can reflect the creativity of the God in the way that we, we build things around us and organise ourselves. But Genesis brings us back to the reality that even in the midst of the most intense urban setting, we are still completely dependent upon God's creation for survival. And we neglect to think about these things at our peril. And beyond just survival, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that just nature is good for us. You know, we have parks and green spaces and places where trees are planted within our urban settings because we recognise it's good for our mental health. It's good for our physical health. It's just good to get out for a walk in the countryside sometimes, isn't it? Good to, if we can't get out into the countryside... To be able to remember, to think, to look at pictures, to watch things on the TV. The blessed David Attenborough telling us all about creation and how it works and others. We need to look after the land. Now many of us are in the comfortable position of owning some land. Probably where we actually live maybe. And we can feel a deep connection to that land, or perhaps we don't in this part of the world so much. But in other parts of the world, the places where people live, they can be really connected to, can't they? Maybe ancestors throughout generations have lived in that same space. But what's happening far too often is that people are being forced out of those places. And as they're forced out of those places, often because of deforestation or uh, because of urbanisation, because of people wanting to make money out of that bit of the land in one way or another. And what happens is they don't only lose their homes and their land, they lose their ability to provide for themselves because their livelihoods are taken away at the same time because they made their, their earnings, they made their way, they provided themselves through the land. Human beings have a very close connection with the land, but sometimes perhaps we forget that. A little later in Genesis, God creates the first human being and names them Adama in the Hebrew. I remember something from my Hebrew lesson at Bible college. It literally means groundling. <laughs> and this is before there was male and female, this is the first human, Adama, groundling, and then from that become male and female. 
Our cultures and our communities are often much better at recon uh, sorry, other cultures and communities are often much better at recognizing this connection with the land. Let me tell you about the, the Guandadule people who live off the coast of Panama. And they practice something which may sound a bit kind of yucky to us or whatever, but they practice something at the birth of every single baby that is born. They take uh, the umbilical cords and the placenta and they bury it in the ground and plant a tree where that is buried so that a tree can rise up at every new life that is born. A connection between humanity, new life, and the ground, the land, and creation. I think that's a really powerful picture. You know, we have very different practices, and I'm not suggesting we should start doing this. Uh, uh, yeah, let's not go there. Um, but you, you see, it expresses that, that connection between us as human beings and the ground, the land that we live on, this earth. The, uh, some Aboriginal tribes in uh, Australia rub uh, soil on ba newborn babies. Again, as a sign of that connection, new life. Coming from the ground is where we originated. And this is where we live. The grandfather of the baby at that, when they're burying and planting the tree, at that ceremony will shout out this, Our great, good and great God, we thank you for the life you give this baby. We have come from the earth and we give back to the earth. Today we bury these symbols of life and give back of your own generosity so that, just as the child grows strong and healthy, this cacao tree will grow big and strong. For we are one, humans and the earth. Isn't that beautiful? We can learn from other contexts. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, once wrote, Receive the world that God has given. Go for a walk. Get wet. Dig the earth. Some of us may be wishing we could get wet at the moment, longing for some rain to come. But are there practices that we can develop in our world, in our life, in our day-to-day -day lives, which help us to remember and to live in the reality of this connection that we have with this creation in which we live? And perhaps we'll be more inclined to take care of this creation if we recognise how intimately we're, we're connected with it. Does that make sense? So we thought about land for a little bit. We're going to think a bit now about trees. We don't uh, have time now to, to list them all, but right from the start of the, the Bible throughout, there are many, many trees throughout God's word. If you have some time over this summer, you might like to flick through the Bible and, uh, and think about all those times when trees are mentioned within God's word. The, the trees in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis, through to the tree which Jesus hung on as he gave up his life for us. And to the tree that we look forward to seeing one day in the city, the garden city. Trees really are rather remarkable as well, if we pause to consider them. Latest scientific uh, research has discovered that trees are social beings, sharing food with their own species and sometimes even competitors. They are connected by a vast underground system of roots interwoven with an astonishingly dense network of fungal mycelium, whatever that is, which exchange, they exchange nutrients with one another to help neighbours in times of need. Enables trees even to pass information between themselves about insects that may be coming to cause damage or droughts or other dangers. And they communicate with one another above the ground as well. I didn't know this. It's incredible to me. Maybe you are much better educated about trees than I am. But apparently in the African savannah, when a giraffe starts to eat uh, a particular tree, that tree will send ethylene as a warning gas to other trees in the vicinity. Did you know this? No, it's incredible, isn't it? And immediately they pump giraffe-repelling toxins into their leaves. And the giraffes have to leave that area and go quite a distance away to find a tree that didn't get the memo. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? I, I had no idea that trees could do that. They communicate with one another. It's, it's amazing. There's a guy called Peter Woolenbeam, or whatever his name is, who suggests that trees may even scream when they are thirsty. He says when the roots aren't taking up, up enough water, the trunks of the trees actually begin to vibrate. 
And if you think about the way that we make noise with our voices, it's about vibrations, isn't it? He says it might even be like a warning to other trees, or maybe it's just mechanical, it's just the way they're built, but they, they make noise. We can't hear it because it's ultrasonic, but it's happening. It's amazing. Trees are wonderful things in and of themselves. God saw them and he said, they're good. <laughs> he stopped Pete Gregg one day and said, have a look at that tree. Isn't it cool? They provide home for food and countless home and food for countless species, including human beings. They protect and enrich the soil. They absorb CO2, incredibly important today. But despite their incredible value, deforestation continues to happen at an alarming rate, doesn't it? Over half the world's tropical forests have been destroyed since the 1960s. Isn't that horrific? And we can hear a stat like that and point the finger and say, isn't that awful that those terrible people are doing that? And there's an element of truth within that. But we are collectively human beings, all connected with one another as we are connected with, human, with creation. The decisions that we make impact things that happen around the world. The Congo Basin in Africa, the Amazon in South America, palm oil production in Asia, right across the world, deforestation is having horrific effects. Dire effect on trees and therefore on creation as a whole on our planet. Destroys biodiversity, worsening climate change, disturbing water cycles, disrupting lives and livelihoods and human rights abuses by the companies engaging in that work. We are all called to follow God in loving and cherishing his world. God looked at his creation and he saw it was very good. He calls us to look at his creation, to see it is very good, to recognise it's been entrusted to us and therefore to take care of it. Not only in our, not only in our understanding but in our practice too, living lives of gratitude, reverence and appreciation. How can we claim to be Christians if we engage in the destruction of God's creation, like deforestation? And yet we do, albeit often unwittingly, when we eat a high meat diet or dairy high diet, when we purchase products with palm oil in, when we buy wood and paper products without making sure that they've come from a sustainable forest or from recycled paper. So we should all be reducing our paper usage as much as we can. Using recycled paper wherever we can, and definitely, at the very least, we should all be using recycled loo roll. We can calculate our carbon emissions and offset them. Directly funding tree planting programs or reduced fuel cook stoves projects in Uganda or Kenya or Ghana or Mexico. We can pray. We can pray that God would help us to educate ourselves, to understand what are the decisions that we need to make, the changes in our actions which will implicate changes in other parts of the world as well. We can pray for God to intervene, for governance to produce the laws and legislation that will make changes to make things like deforestation illegal, to stop people dis being, being displaced from our homes, to stop the trees being cut down. We can change our diets and be careful about where the products that we buy and consume come from. We can really make a difference. And one of the, one of the cheapest, one of the coolest, one of the, the greatest ways that we can impact our creation is by planting trees. It's not a hard thing to do, actually, planting a tree. Have you ever planted a tree? It's not that tricky. Even locally, in Oaks Park, if you looked at the link this week, you'll see there was an article in the link this week about friends of Oak Park, Oaks Park who are having a Jubilee Cops just up the road in Oaks Park. And you can join with them, you can help them out if you want to, you can just donate if you'd like to, or you can support Tear Fund and their projects, as we have done as a church recently. There are loads of organisations that we can support, whether physically planting a tree ourselves in our back garden would be a good start. 
or supporting other organisations who are working to do the same elsewhere. Our world is filled with beauty, isn't it? We have a generous God, not a miserly God who has just given us kind of one type of tree, one shade of green, one type of grass, but a God who is abundantly created, a God who has packed his creation, filled with the ability to go on creating. Notice how Genesis says that the, tr the trees bearing fruit with seed in them. That's how God has made creation. The fruit falls to the ground and out pops another tree. Not quite that quickly, but... We have a God who loves to bless, a God who's given us creation, a God who is love. God who, is, we were thinking last week, exists within himself. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is always loving, always loving, always loving. Father loves the Son and the Spirit. Son loves the Father and the Spirit. Spirit loves the Father and the Son. God who is always loving and out of that love has burst out creation. And he's entrusted it to us. And said, here you go. Look at that tree, isn't it cool? <laughs> Let's take care of this creation in the way that we live our lives. Small decisions that we can make can make a big difference. We have a wonderful God who has placed us within this incredible creation. We are truly blessed. Let's not take these things for granted. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your creation. We thank you uh, for this passage in Genesis. Lord, I've said a lot of words uh, about uh, these few verses. I just pray that the things that are from you would remain. Lord, thank you that you saw what you made and you think is very good. Thank you you see us and you think we're good. Lord, help us to act in ways, to live lives which uh, bless and encourage and are positive for your creation. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Time uh, together in here is drawing to a close. We're going to uh, sing together, first of all, from the highest of heights, indescribable. And then uh, we're going to sing the blessing, uh, kind of over one another. So... Uh, I won't kind of pray at the end. Um, we'll just sing the blessing and then please do stick around for coffee if you're able. Do I know how many shades of green there are? No, I don't. 70 shades of green. There you go. I can see some of you are wearing them this, this morning. It's wonderful. <laughs> Shall we stand together as we continue to work? <coughs>
Amen. God bless you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.